Happy to have you join me. I'm Bob Weathers. <clears throat> I was thinking this morning as I was uh, getting ready to uh, move into my day of how grateful I am for uh, all of you who watch uh, this each week. Many of you are regular uh, participants and I just want to acknowledge you. I really appreciate your presence. Some of you actively engage uh, uh, with us and you're invited to do that. You can <clears throat> write to my uh, producer, uh, Austin Armstrong. He'll, uh, he'll uh, forward your questions and comments to me in real time. And if you've been here before, you know that we do our best to address those. I'd like to also acknowledge my missing counterpart today, Odie Martinez. He's away today. And so it's just you and me today in Austin. Okay, so I want to welcome you. And I, um, I, I suppose it's in the spirit of Thanksgiving. Just really appreciative for this opportunity, appreciative of Austin's um, hosting and organizing and facilitating all the technology and the marketing behind this weekly podcast. I just met uh, earlier today uh, with uh, the clinical director from Beginnings Treatment Centers, Dr. Asan Garajadagi, who's been a long-term friend and a major supporter uh, very directly of Beginnings Treatment Centers and Therapy Cable. And I want to extend a gratitude to you, Dr. G, as well as Beginnings. I want to recommend uh, for you, if you're watching for the first time, we have lots and lots of uh, podcasts now accrued in various archival locations. I mentioned Beginnings Treatment Centers. You can just look them up online and go to their podcast drop-down menu, and there you have it. There's all kinds of resources there, including uh, this series now for almost a year of Ask an Addiction Specialist. You can also find our videos archived on YouTube <clears throat> under the same title, Ask an Addiction Specialist. And maybe you've joined us today through our Facebook group uh, under that title, and, uh, and, and you can find our, our resources accessed there as well. Eventually, I'll catch up with myself because I have a, I have a web page that has a lot of our podcasts, but I, I'm not nearly caught up. And so... I'll give you that address a little bit later. It's a, a way that you can reach out directly to me after the podcast if you have questions or comments. I do receive uh, comments uh, each week uh, and people interested in, in what services might be available, etc. Very happy to uh, respond to you. So lots of opportunities uh, for us to be in conversation, not only today, but also during the week. <clears throat> Let me say a word about uh, my own background. I was thinking of uh, that also this morning. Um, I, my background's in clinical psychology. My uh, doctorate's in clinical psychology. I operated for uh, uh, decades as a licensed clinical psychologist. I ended up uh, becoming addicted to alcohol and other drugs in midlife, which is uh, my particular uh, trajectory. It's, it's not the typical one, but that's my story. And in the process, uh, really had to change my whole life, including my career. I lost my license as a clinical psychologist owing to the uh, consequences of addiction and spent uh, 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 the last 10 years in my own recovery as well as uh, bringing my skill set to bear specifically on addiction. I spend uh, uh, each workday of the week all day long working with those in recovery or their loved ones. And I, as I was talking to Dr. G, who I mentioned earlier, Today, I feel so grateful to be uh, in a time in my life and in a career that from the time I wake up in the morning until the time I go to bed at night, I told Dr. G, I said, when I go to bed at night, I'm tired, but it's a good tired. <laughs> it's a good tired. I feel really grateful to be involved in recovery coaching, um, which is a good bit of what I do in terms of uh, meeting with individuals here locally, as well as online, addressing issues around addiction and recovery. I also lead, uh, I think at last count, eight or nine groups a week here locally in various treatment centers, uh, um, as well as this podcast and one other podcast. Um, so I get lots of opportunities to work this material and uh, becomes part of my own recovery too. I'm grateful for that. And the other chunk of what I do is that I'm a professor of clinical psychology at a local university. Calling a local university is a bit of a misnomer because it's an online university and we have students literally all over the world so in this day and age 
uh, local uh, has to be put in italics, I guess. And so I work for California Southern University, and I devote uh, about a day a week to supervising uh, doctoral dissertations in their uh, Doctor of Psychology program. <clears throat> Virtually all the dissertations that I'm involved with address addiction and recovery. And so it can be addiction to substance, it can be addicted, addiction to certain behaviors. Uh, uh, sexual addiction is one of the ones that has come up for several dissertations that I'm working on. Also work on, on issues of recovery, so looking at resources for recovery, including the topic of today's presentation, which is on mindfulness. So it's a bit of a background, and I'll get to the topic of today in just a moment, but I wanted to say a, a word more, and this is part, part of what came to me this morning, is that I introduce myself each week as, uh, as my, with my background in psychology, and I do that with purpose, uh, and I want to explain that. The focus of my work for the last 40 years has been in the domain of psychology, and so it stands to reason that when I come to working in recovery, that the perspective or perspectives that I bring are primarily informed by, by my background in psychology. I've uh, studied widely, and I've also uh, 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 taught a lot, uh, taught therapists, taught psychologists over the years, and learned a lot from them, as well as supervision, both giving and receiving supervision and so on. And so a psychological perspective is really my front yard or my strong suit in terms of what I bring to recovery. I don't for a second mistake that for being uh, all of the territory of recovery at all. And some of you who are listening in might come from a, a psychological therapeutic background and, and much of what I reference will be familiar to you. Um, the value, I think, one of the values in my presenting each week from a psychological perspective is that for some of you, it'll be less, uh, less familiar for you. And, I, and, and I'll, I'll tell you uh, part of the reason for that, many of you coming into recovery, whether it's you yourself in recovery from addiction or maybe you're a family member of someone in addiction, if you've come into addiction and recovery through, for example, the 12-step movement or other self-help support groups, uh, oftentimes, uh, the approach I'll, I'll mention specifically of 12-step groups like AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, or NA, Narcotics Anonymous, or Al-Anon, which is for family members, and so on, is the approach is um, more oftentimes the emphasis is placed on spirituality. So, for example, one of the, uh, the uh, credos in AA is that addiction or alcoholism is seen as a spiritual problem that requires a spiritual solution. And... Uh, I fully agree with that. It's not the focus of my own work. The focus of my own work isn't primarily spiritual. Uh, it's very rare that I work with a client in recovery where we don't address spirituality. <clears throat> but that's not my, uh, that's not my uh, uh, front yard again. That would be much more the focus of many of the self-help support groups. Or for example, uh, individuals who work within a pastoral or, or a religious context where their addiction is framed in terms of religious or spiritual principles and values. And I think that that's absolutely uh, important. And I, I give it co-equal status to psychology. It's just my backgrounds in psychology. I work closely uh, not only with local treatment centers, but also with uh, a local group um, of, of medical personnel, a physician and uh, a nutritionist who focus on the biomedical uh, perspective or perspectives on addiction. And uh, I feel like that that's absolutely critical. I was just speaking earlier today with an individual from out of state who's interested in recovery and is very interested in addressing psychological and spiritual components or perspectives on his addiction. And I, 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 I stated clearly what I thought is I felt like that he needed to be stabilized, first of all, biologically in order to accomplish that work. And so even though I'm not a physician by background, I really wanted him to address seriously the biomedical perspective or those foundations, I believe, in order to do good psychological and spiritual work. And so I guess what I'm saying is that I really do really, it's not just, um, it's not just words for me. I really do believe in a body, mind, spirit approach, not only to addiction and recovery, but also to just us being who we are as human beings. I don't think that any of us are not bodies any more than I think you can exclude the mind or spirit. In fact, I, I, I include a couple of other perspectives that are kind of interwoven there. I also uh, believe very strongly in the value of addressing the soul of individuals. Now, 
I'll be talking about that next week when I address uh, creative processes, for example, and I'll expand more on what I mean by soul. Um, for you to know, if, if you're new to this podcast, a lot of my training, uh, postdoctoral training, was in the Jung Institute here locally uh, in Los Angeles. For six years, I trained there intensively. Uh, Jung as in J-U-N-G, Carl Jung was a psychiatrist. He was the kind of prize student of Sigmund Freud, who's oftentimes seen as kind of the founder of contemporary psychoanalysis and certainly uh, more broadly psychotherapy. Carl Jung was one of his prize pupils. As fate would have it, Carl Jung was instrumental in, in the, uh, uh, the early correspondence around the development of, of Alcoholics Anonymous. And so he himself uh, had uh, a lot of comments to make about addiction, um, as he wrote in the early to mid part of the last century. But my training in Jung uh, uh, gave me a focus very much on what Carl Jung called the soul. In fact, the first book I think I read by Carl Jung was called Modern Man in Search of a Soul. And so I think a soul perspective is really important. One of Carl Jung's prize students himself was James Hillman, and he's been very influential in my understanding the importance of soul in psychology as well as in recovery. And both Carl Jung and James Hillman have also impacted me in looking at another dimension, which I think of as shadow. And we'll be talking uh, in the next two to three weeks about the role of shadow and unpacking that in relationship to recovery. So if we, if we include body, mind, soul, spirit, and shadow, that covers a lot of ground <laughs> in terms of recovery. And I feel like that it, uh, to really address recovery fully requires a multi-dimensional perspective. And I don't know that any of us can be expert in all of those dimensions. I suppose my expertise, I don't suppose, I think it's the case. My expertise would be in the arena probably of mind slash psychology, which focuses on emotions and relationships. And I'd say right up next to that is my focus on, I've had a strong interest in um, theories of creativity and the impact of creativity on human functioning for my whole career as a psychologist, as well as my prior <laughs> my previous grounding in uh, creativity myself. I'm smiling because just last night I played drums with a local ensemble for the first time. It's a new band, Austin. And uh, I've played drums for 55 years. And uh, before that, I played piano. I was just music has been central to my life. And so it's hard for me to think of psychology and healing. It's actually hard for me to think of spirituality without including creative process. And so that gives you a flavor for, I think, both what it is that our podcast here focuses on I'm an addiction specialist, let's say, let's agree, <laughs> who focuses primarily on a psychological perspective, but has a deep appreciation for body and soul and spirit and shadow as well. So, so that's our introduction for today. I welcome you. Last week, we celebrated Thanksgiving by uh, spending a good bit of our conversation talking about gratitude and the role of gratitude. I tried an experiment this morning, Austin, since you're here with me. I, I swim most every morning in a local community pool. And, and uh, typically I get up and I, I, I have about an hour of quiet time, meditation and quiet time, in which I include what we talked about last week, which is gratitude. And uh, this morning, owing to my having played music late last night and getting home late and having to get up early to unpack my drums for my car, I had to make a choice between my swimming, which it takes me about an hour, and my quiet time. And I thought, what would it be like to combine my quiet time and my swimming? And so this morning, my, my quiet time was swimming. And so I swim. It's pretty dark. I'm quiet where I swim. I swim these long laps in an Olympic-sized pool. And so I practiced gratitude as I was swimming this morning to see if I could coordinate breathing and being thankful at the same time. And it worked out okay. I didn't drown. I mean, <laughs> so... Always looking for new ways to create pockets of space for uh, for spirit, uh, for grounding, for sure. I, I, I tied a little string around my finger, figuratively. Last week I shared with you all, if you watched last week's podcast, that I was going to bring to my family on Thanksgiving what we talked about last week, which was gratitude practice. And I do want to follow up on that, and this is Truth and Lending is that when, when push came to shove the day of, we were at a restaurant here locally, I realized that it felt really hokey to say to everybody, we're, we're gathered together around a table, okay, everybody, I'm gonna, we're going to do gratitude now. 
want to do this in public just felt really didn't seem right to me. So I'll tell you what I shared with them. As I shared with, with uh, my family that was gathered around the table in public, I shared with them that I had told you guys that I was promising to do this. <laughs> and I said, I, I promised yesterday on the podcast that we'd be doing gratitude practice. And what I did is I talked through what we talked about. I talked through the various forms of gratitude. If you were here, you'll recall, we talked about gratitude for the physical realm, our physical health, and every kind of variation on that. We talked about gratitude for physical security in terms of the material world. We talked about gratitude for emotional security, relational security in our lives. We talked about gratitude for closeness, for emotional intimacy in our lives, spiritual communion with like-minded like, like souls. We talked about gratitude for ways that we're able to exercise our gifts uh, to really, uh, uh, um, practice our competencies, and then we tied that into gratitude for living a life that, that has purpose and meaning. And so we, we did that practice last week, and I guide you to that uh, video podcast if you weren't here to, to review that because there's a, a five or ten minute meditation where we did that. Now, I didn't want to drag my family through this in public. That just felt inappropriate, and it took me being there to realize that. But I did share with them what I just shared with you right now. And what it led to was by far the richest Thanksgiving conversation in memory. And I'll tell you where it went is that to a one, we went around the table and it, and it started spontaneously. People began to share, all of us shared, uh, with tears flowing, um, what was meaningful to us in our lives. I can already talk about it right now without crying. It was very touching. And so it worked out just fine. <laughs> we had a beautiful Thanksgiving dinner. In fact, <clears throat> a few people have asked me uh, this the last several days. In fact, somebody asked me just in the last hour or two. I'm trying to remember who it was who asked me. They said, how was your Thanksgiving? And I said, it was very, very meaningful. <laughs> and I, what I meant was what I just shared with you. It's like, when, 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 you can, when do you get to have an experience of a, a holiday and to say that that's the truth, that's what happened. So I want to thank you all for being my conscience last week. <laughs> okay. Our topic for today is, uh, the title is Waking Up with Mindfulness. Waking Up with Mindfulness. And as I'll share, um, as we go through the presentation, I mean something specific by waking up. I didn't wake up and just come up with that term. I'll, I'll give you a context for that as we move through the material. And also, uh, by mindfulness, I mean something very specific in terms of a practice. And we'll actually do a, 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 an exercise in mindfulness, a very specific one that we haven't done before here on this podcast before. So Austin, <laughs> this will be a new meditation. <laughs> so we, we plan to do that in a few minutes too. So let me again invite you to feel free to submit questions and comments. In, in Odie's absence today, I rely on you all <laughs> to be my discussant, my counterpoint. So uh, thank you for joining. Um, what I'd like to do is start with a, um, uh, or kind of a theme that I want to weave through there is, one of the things I'm aware of is that implicit in our conversations each week are materials that I'm either familiar with um, uh, uh, from the past. Most of the material is recent because my own, my own deepening into my personal recovery has been in the last uh, five to ten years, and so most of what I'm reading is recent, for sure, but I have 40 or 50 years of reading psychology that I rely on. Thank you. There's a comment. Hmm. So beautiful. What I'm crying about is that somebody just shared a very kind comment. It means a lot to me. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> Much appreciated. It was an appreciation that one of our listeners shared that's very touching to me. It reminds me of something that my mother used to say about me growing up. 
uh, we had a challenging family situation growing up. I'll leave it at that for right now. <clears throat> but one of the things, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. One of the things my mom said to me uh, across the years, uh, she said two things. She said, uh, she said, Bobby, uh, you amaze me because you're so resilient. <clears throat> and as soon as I came to understand what that word meant, <laughs> it was meaningful to me and kind of mixed. It was a very difficult family situation I grew up in, and I think that I was resilient. And that resilience, I think, was based so much in relationships where there, there was kindness and care given to me. I'll get to, there's another comment, and I'll get to that. I may have to ask you to bring that back up in a minute, but I will get to that as we get deeper in the material. There's a comment about, a question about mindfulness. I'd like to address that. Uh, so being resilient, I felt like I, I was given gifts, that's for sure. But the other thing that my mom said about me, she says, Bobby, uh, you're so appreciative. You're so appreciative. And I am. <laughs> The task here is to move into what I was going to say, which is a bit more intellectual, which will relieve me from crying on camera. <laughs> but I don't really want to move too quickly away from appreciation because, uh, uh, you know, it's really in the spirit of last week's presentation. We could all stand uh, to open our hearts to more gratitude, including to share that with one another in the way that you have, Karen, right now with me. So thank you for that. And I really honor that. Uh, it's so easy in contemporary society to move quickly uh, or maybe to take for granted all the things that we're all subject to. And so to pause for a second and express gratitudes. I know I said this last week, but I want to reiterate it in case you weren't here, is that one of the things that I'm grateful for, uh, and as I said, I tried to do it today when I swam and it actually worked, is that it makes such a difference for me each day to stop and do what you just did, Karen, which is to express gratitude. And I do it in my, um, in my prayers. I express gratitude for the whole range that we just shared earlier um, in terms of uh, physical health, in terms of uh, security, a roof over my head, and all that goes with that, secure relationships that I can trust and rely on, um, uh, uh, close contact and connection, loving connection. Every every Wednesday when I come in to see Austin, I have such care for him, and I feel his for me. And I just I don't take any of that for granted. I'll tell you guys a story. Austin knows this. Is when I leave today, uh, I go out each week to the front desk. Tiffany and Jessica are at the front desk, and they go, "Oh, good, it's Bob Wednesday," <laughs> and they stamp my ticket for parking. That kind of stuff really makes a difference. You know what I'm saying? It's thank you, Tiffany and Jessica, to be so kind. And they do that each week. And it's just the simplest gesture. But uh, uh, I'd like to add uh, to, to each day what those kinds of uh, gestures, wh what they do to me. I want to pass that along. And so uh, I'm all for uh, tenderizing our souls to be grateful for the people that touch us and for the gifts that have been given us and the opportunities that have been given us. How does this relate to addiction and recovery? Uh, just about every way. <laughs> I feel this so strongly personally, and I, I just came from a group this afternoon where, where I'm sitting with a group of men, and we talk about this very frankly, is that you can't fight something, namely addiction, with nothing. You have to fight it with something that's equal or greater. And I think what we're talking about is equal or greater. And I don't make any presumption that this is easy to access, especially in early recovery. And for some men and women that I work with, they've never accessed what we're talking about. But then it's time that we begin to cultivate the soil so that there can be resource uh, unearthed. And uh, I care a lot about doing that. <laughs> Uh, and it, for each one of us, it starts with ourselves. So that's what the tears are for or about, is that it touches deep places inside. 
I want to share with you some uh, materials I've uh, reviewed more recently. In fact, to be honest with you, at any given time, I'm usually reading about a half a dozen books. I read a lot. I don't know. I think there are people that read more than I do, but I read a fair bit. And I generally have a number of books going and I'm kind of cross-referencing them. So I have about a half a dozen books I'm reading right now. And I want to share with one of, uh, one of them with you that, uh, the, and the way it goes for me is I'll read a book and sometimes I'll turn right around and read it again. Uh, 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 because I want to deepen into the material. It's just what I've done for my career in psychology. And, and, uh, and this is one of those books I'm going to mention to you in just a moment. There was a comment or a question about mindfulness, and I'm going to come back to that, but I want to get into the mindfulness material first before I come back to that, because it will better inform the question. It was a good question about mindfulness. We'll come back to it. Uh, I want to introduce you to a book, and I'm, I'm, I'm bringing these up, and I'm asking uh, Austin to bring these up on screen. I have them in the PowerPoint for purpose, because I'm recommending you read these books. Uh, if a book is overly technical, I typically won't bring that to this because I do read technical books that would require you having a background sufficient to understand the book, and that's not, that's not required with the books I'm going to mention today. So here's a good book written by somebody who's really intelligent, and part of his intelligence is being able to write in English. This is by Judson Brewer. Uh, this book is called The Craving Mind. I highly recommend it. It came out, what's the date on that? Does it, does it show in the PowerPoint? It's probably too small, let's see. It's in the subtitle that you probably can't see. Okay, oh, thank you. Do my PowerPoints not show the little subtitles underneath them? They don't. Well, dadgummit. <laughs> this book came out in 2017. That's good to know. I have a little uh, bar underneath my PowerPoint. I'm just looking over there, so the bar, the, the bar doesn't come up in the PowerPoint. Wow, that's the first time I realized that. That one does, but this one doesn't. Okay, good to know. All right, okay, thank you. <laughs> this book, oh, there it is. Can you, okay, how'd you do that? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if you're supposed to talk or not, but <laughs> that was magic. Um, this book came out in 2017. Uh, at the time that it came out, Judson Brewer, thank you, uh, Austin. Uh, Judson Brewer, uh, was a, he's an uh, addiction psychiatrist, specialized in addiction psychiatry, and he was on the faculty at Yale University. Since the book came out, he's now working at Harvard at the, their uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction clinic. He's working with John Kabat-Zinn at, um, at Harvard. And uh, Judson Brewer is one of, one of the really brilliant figures right now in contemporary addiction recovery. And I highly recommend this book uh, uh, because he translates very technical information into uh, something that's very easily assimilated. And I want to talk a little bit about a couple of points that Judson Brewer makes. And what I'm doing is I'm setting up our mindfulness practice in, in a few minutes. Uh, uh, Judson Brewer's background is kind of parallel to mine. When I started graduate school, um, I started in the fall of 1979, and by the summer of 1980 is when I began uh, practicing mindfulness, and so that was all those years ago, 38 years ago. And uh, a couple years after I began my mindfulness practice, I began my doctoral dissertation, which was on mindfulness. Um, and so uh, that it's a very, very, very much parallels Judson Brewer's life, except I think he's probably about 15 or 20 years younger than I am. So when he started medical school, he began mindfulness training and practice, and uh, uh, it's informed his uh, uh, pursuing psychiatry. And he's one of the national experts, especially in the domains of psychology and psychiatry, on mindfulness. And so. Uh, you do well to read uh, this book by him just to address mindfulness, much less of how he applies it to addiction, which is so much of the work that I feel like uh, I'm doing these days as well. <clears throat> I think he has the clearest exposition of what happens in addiction. Oftentimes we'll talk about stress being the number one trigger for relapse. I don't feel like that most of us that have been addicted use for no reason, and typically it starts off to manage some form of stress. I just asked the group of men this afternoon, what stresses you out? And the answers are almost always overlapping from one week to the next when I pose this question. Relationships, family, partners, siblings, loved ones, um, finances, work. Somebody mentioned today repetition, boredom at work. Um, uh, the issue of boredom more generally. Um, Worries about the future, uh, regrets about the past, anything that leads us 
uh, to experience stress. I know that in the 12-step programs, we talk about people, places, and things. My interest in psychology is looking at the interior mirror of that. And so if it's people out there, places out there, I'm interested in what, what does that activate inside that manifests as stress. And uh, that stress, uh, the way we talk about it in our groups is that that stress will kick up the cortisol levels or the adrenaline levels, these are stress hormones, and that one of the most effective means for rebalancing the brain, the brain and the body want to be in balance, is to inject dopamine into the system. Dopamine is the uh, uh, brain chemical, brain neurotransmitter, most associated with the reward center of the brain. And dopamine will rebalance the system and actually kick, kick the uh, teeter-totter this direction. And that's a good thing for short-term uh, rebalancing of the brain. The problem with that is that the brain doesn't want to be out of balance and so when there's too much dopamine and most of the addictive substances get so much dopamine going on in the brain, so much of a release of dopamine, is that the body needs to rebalance and guess how the body rebalances. It rebalances by kicking more cortisol into the system. And so you get going in this kind of yo-yo response that's very difficult to break, very difficult to break. It's the source of withdrawal uh, 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 for sure, withdrawal is basically a cortisol response uh, 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 in reaction to uh, dopamine, excessive dopamine. And so that's a biological understanding of it. If you've been addicted uh, uh, and have experienced withdrawal, you don't need a biological explanation to know that it's absolutely misery defined. So Judson Brewer talks about, he talks about this whole cycle in terms of reward-based learning. And it's very simple. And how it goes is that there's a trigger. The trigger in this case would be stress. There's a behavior in reaction to that that has proven in the past to provide relief from that. So you engage in the behavior, let's say in this case an addictive behavior. It leads to a reduction in stress, that's the reward. And then as Judson Brewer says, trigger, behavior, reward, repeat. <laughs> So that's the cycle. That's the cycle. I don't think it gets much simpler than that. It's a way to understand a good bit of the sustaining nature of addiction. It's also, I think, very helpful to understand addiction scientifically or medically so as to move out of, uh, uh, of a judgment that shames us for what doesn't make sense and really is stupid at one level, but makes complete sense psychologically and biologically and begins to suggest what we might do. And so to cut to the chase here is that if the trigger is stress and that leads to addictive behavior, leads to the reward, and I repeat that, one of the things that I wanna do is see if I can find a toehold in reducing stress. At this point, enter in mindfulness. <clears throat> Let me introduce you to the second book that I've brought today. This is a, a recent book as well. The date for this is 2017. This book is the Mind Body, Body Workbook for Addiction. This is co-authored by two friends of mine, one very dear friend of mine, Guy Duplessis, and the primary author is Stanley Block. Uh, Dr. Block is a psychiatrist up in the Washington, Washington State, Seattle area. Guy Duplessis is a very dear friend of mine who lives in Cape Town. He's in South Africa. They co-authored a book that, among other things, talks about what we just discussed, but they talk about it in terms of the brain. And here's how it goes, is that our brain naturally defaults towards vigilance, scanning for any potential threat. Uh, the, the individual that can be aware of potential threats and ward those off is gonna survive, and so is favored evolutionarily. And so our brains, the default, it's referred to as the default mode network, and Guy and, uh, 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 Stan discusses at length in their book, the default mode network is where we operate most of the time. You can begin to see where this goes for somebody who's prone to addiction, is that if my default mode network keeps me in vigilance mode, guess what that does to my cortisol level? Being in vigilance mode stirs my uh, stress uh, reaction for sure. And so I'm just kind of constantly in a stress red alert mode. And we've already established with Justin Brewer's work on the craving mind, the basis of craving is craving relief from the stress. And so what do we do about the fact that our brains naturally default towards a, a mode of thinking that oftentimes uh, adds stress? What uh, Guy and Stan discuss in their book, this, it's a very practical workbook. I highly recommend this book as well. By the way, both these books are available in multiple formats. You can get them 
electronically. I read them in Kindle. You can get them in hard copy. And you can get, at least with Judson uh, Brewer's book, you can get it in audiobook if you want to listen to the book. I kind of get it in all formats and just <laughs> saturate myself with the material. In uh, Guy and Stan's book, the Mind Body Workbook, uh, uh, they suggest this is where they introduce mindfulness is that is that if my brain naturally defaults towards this more stressed mode of vigilance, what can I do to uh, kind of recalibrate? And they suggest mindfulness, and we're gonna do an exercise in a moment that is an example of what they discuss in the book. The idea with mindfulness is it's impossible to be in a mindful, a state of mind, um, a, a state of presence that uh, uh, is kind of one step removed from that default mode network. It's impossible to be in that and stay in that default mode network. In fact, they discuss a second network, and this is what biologists call the executive mode network. And so when I practice mindfulness as one form of, of uh, self-calming, I basically transition from a uh, being located, my center of gravity being the default mode network, I relocate to the executive mode network. It's simplistic, but I'll share this as an analogy, is that our fight, flight, stress mode is primarily located between our ears in the midbrain. And what they're talking about, what Guy and Stan and, and Judson Brewer are talking about, is moving from that being dominant to moving towards frontal cortex, which is able to provide soothing and containment of anxiety. And, and so the executive mode network, sometimes the frontal cortex is just referred to as the executive part of the brain. So what we're trying to do is move towards the executive part of the brain. And uh, uh, when I talk to a group of people that are in, in early recovery from addiction, every one of them can recognize how they've tried to move out of that fight or flight uh, uh, place, that kind of reactive stress-related place, and they've done it via substance. And so it stands to reason that if they don't come up with a substitute for addiction to substance to address stress reduction, some way to quiet the default mode network, if they don't, haven't come up with an alternative, they will relapse to the addiction. So it's absolutely imperative that we come up with alternatives. And mindfulness practice is one of those. And so let's engage in an exercise in just a moment. Can I re -see that question? There's a couple of questions. Let me take a look at this question and see if it wants to be answered now or maybe after exercise. The first question about mindfulness, I will come back to after the exercise, because the exercise will actually provide information that's relevant to that question. So I will come back to that. The second question. I want to come back to both questions. Uh, both questions are good. The second question is about uh, kind of the equal and opposite. What's equal to addiction? How do you counterbalance uh, balance addiction? And I want to talk about the, the good, the bad, and the ugly about that. I will address that too. I think it'll make a lot more sense in the context of our having practiced uh, uh, five minutes of insight practice. Okay, so let's do that and, and I'll come back to this. Austin, will you help me remember too? I, I do want to come back to that. What I want to do is introduce a very brief mindfulness of the breath exercise for a minute or two, and then spend two or three minutes in what's referred to in the meditation literature or in the mindfulness literature as insight practice. It's a very specific practice. And the goal of it is this. I'll say it and then I'll lead us in it. The goal is to notice how your mind naturally operates. We're going to have a living experiment right now. You don't have to believe what I said about default mode network. We're just going to spend a few minutes saying hello to our default mode network, okay? So I want you to join me in an exercise that more than likely will bring the default mode network into clear focus. And then we'll unpack that uh, experience together with a couple of uh, exercises, questions, as well as my addressing the questions that have been submitted. And uh, I'll also introduce some resources to kind of further deepen that. So, but let's do the meditation right now. So let me uh, ask you to join me. I'm gonna close my eyes. I invite you to do that too. Um, if that's uncomfortable, you can just lower your eyes. And the, the idea of this is just simply to reduce distraction. So we'll start by just uh, focusing on our breath to kind of give us an anchor for our attention. So if you're taking a deep breath and let that out when you're ready. Another deep in-breath. out-breath. 
On your next deep inhalation, as you, uh, as you inhale, pull the air deep down into your lungs and feel your stomach rise slightly. That's the diaphragm. Feel your whole lungs till your diaphragm rises. And notice that as you breathe in. And then as you breathe out, feel that diaphragm settle. It'll, it'll fall. Feel it fall or let go. Do that again. Feel your stomach rise as you breathe in. See it fall as you breathe out. We're going to use that rising and falling of our stomach, or of our diaphragm, as kind of our reference point. Like I used the word anchor a moment ago. What I'm going to ask us to do as you breathe in and breathe out, I want you to notice what goes across uh, your mind. Some people talk about our mind like the sky and that there are certain clouds that just kind of spontaneously arise. Uh, we're in Southern California uh, today, Austin and I, and it's unusual, but the clouds, are, the clouds clouds are fully in the sky. It's supposed to rain today or tomorrow. So we have lots of clouds and you may experience lots of clouds as we meditate. The goal here is to focus on our breath and when a thought arises, See if you can notice that thought as close to its arising as possible. And here's where it gets interesting. Rather than following the thought, see if you can just make note of the thought. I recommend just using this word, thinking. Thinking, thinking. But rather than following the thought, see if you can gently set that thought aside. I think of an imaginary shelf in my mind. So if you can set that thought aside and then re-anchor your attention to the rising and falling of your breath. And so the rhythm will go something like this. Rising, falling, thinking, thinking, rising, falling. And so I want to try that for two or three minutes together. I, I, I think, owing to some feedback I had earlier today in another group I led, I think I'll just be silent. So I don't think I want to interrupt you. So I hope the format makes sense. Just focus on your breathing. When a thought arises, as quickly as possible, label the thought, but don't follow its content. Set the thought aside, gently bringing yourself back to your breath. And do that uh, for the next, let's say, two or three minutes.
Okay, that's two minutes. Seems like a really long two minutes. <laughs> at least in this context. It's funny, usually in the mornings I meditate for 20 minutes and, and uh, it goes by quickly. I'm aware of being here with Austin and we're on camera and those two minutes seem like a long time. You may wonder how I know it's two minutes. <laughs> um, every breath cycle takes 15 seconds for me. <laughs> this is what happens if you have too much spare time on your hands. <laughs> and so I counted eight breath cycles. <laughs> Um, I'm curious how that went for you. That went for you. All. I was aware of having a very active mind myself, and did the best I could to just name the thought as it arose, and then move back to the breath. Two questions for you, uh, if you're uh, watching in. Um, one is, what did you find most helpful about that? Even with the activity of my own mind, I felt myself really moving into that and calming. You can hear it in my voice. I can really feel that. Just two minutes of focusing on the breath moves me out of what we were talking about earlier, the default mode network. And even though I don't completely move out of it because thoughts keep generating and most of them, are, for me, most of those are related to solving some kind of problem or something. Just kind of gently set that aside. I can come back to that later. And then I move into this other mode. If you have any taste of that shift that I'm describing, it's a way to understand this concept of uh, moving from the default mode network to the executive mode network. To tie it back into the earlier comments about Judson Brewer, it's, it's to relate a process by which you learn how to respond to triggers, stress, differently than reaching for a bottle or a needle. Also want to ask, and I'm going to come back to the two questions that Austin shared earlier, I want to ask you, what did you find most challenging? I hardly lead a group these days without including some mindfulness component just because I feel like it's so uh, instrumental to recovery to have as many arrows in your quiver as possible in terms of stress management or self-calming. And uh, this one's easy to do. You know, you can be standing in line at a grocery store. Uh, in fact, I was <laughs> last night, and I will tonight again. And just, you can breathe. You can breathe. And, and uh, actually, those moments where I have to wait become kind of a, a, a mnemonic, a reminder for me just to breathe for a moment at the bank. <laughs> But when I bring this up in groups, uh, uh, I did today, right before I came, and people will talk about feeling a lot calmer. And it didn't happen today, but it often does. I'll say, I'll, I'll ask, uh, did anybody experience challenges around that? And generally, somebody will say, I, I wasn't aware of how much my mind races until I did the meditation. So the truth is, is most of us operate with kind of a background hum that moves in and out of foreground of thoughts. Thoughts like this, and that would be the default mode network. And sometimes we're kind of gloriously unaware of that until we stop to notice that, and you just go, "Holy moly!" I like how they talk about this in the Eastern traditions. They talk about this as monkey mind, of literally a monkey swinging from one branch to the next, and that's the way our brains are. And you can see how it serves um, survival to be aware. It's just that if we can't turn that off ever. It means that we're kind of constantly at this kind of background hum level, which manifests in terms of stress, which has its consequences uh, uh, for our bodies, for our health, and particularly in the domain we're talking about here in this podcast uh, uh, regarding addiction. It's becomes a major, major uh, issue. How do I self-regulate? So if you found while you were involved in this mindfulness exercise that it made you aware, more aware than you were typically, of a baseline hum, then that would be the default mode network. I'm very aware, as I was sitting here, of several thoughts that came up. Some of them are related to what we were just talking about. Some of them are unrelated. And uh, that's just what, that's what Bobby's brain does. <laughs> Austin's brain has his version of it, and I presume you do too. And so to begin to exercise some skillful means for 
turning down the tap or turning it off completely um, might well be of interest to you. If you're interested in resources, I've just mentioned two, and I'm going to mention a couple more in just a moment. Mention Judson's Brewer, Judson Brewer's book on the craving mind. Also mention Stan Block's and Guy Duplessis's book, uh, the, the workbook for uh, addiction, uh, really, really helpful books. Um, Let me come to the two questions right now. I think this might be good. Let's move to three questions. This, uh, the first comment, mindfulness is said to be good for calming and reducing stress. Can you say anything about mindfulness actually bringing up more pain as we face ourselves? Yeah, that's a really good question. One of the pains I just discussed, which is that people will say, uh, literally people will say, I wasn't aware that I was physically in pain until I stopped. And so this comes up not infrequently. And so like literally physical pain, I'm presuming but what you're saying here is you're talking about emotional pain as well. The very same thing is that as long as I just stay busy in this kind of default mode network, then I don't have to feel my pain. And for many of us, that's been an antidote. It has for me a way to kind of numb from feeling pain. And so it's kind of good news, bad news, uh, is that the good news is I can reduce my default mode network activity. The bad news is that stuff may come up that has to be dealt with. If there's any saving grace in this, it feels like to me is that the executive mode network can now be brought to bear on it. And so I'm not running from it. There's a great uh, metaphor I heard years ago, and it's attributed to the Dalai Lama. And I think it applies here. He was walking down a road, I'm going to say in, in Nepal, where he lives now. He was walking down a road with a couple of other uh, monks. And uh, they hear barking behind them. They look back, and they, they see this rabid dog racing towards them. And the story goes, and, and this, can be, this can be legend, and that's fine, because the story still communicates is that the, this rabid dog foaming at the mouth is coming at them barking and the Dalai Lama turned towards the dog and began walking towards the dog. Actually addressed the dog and moved towards it. <clears throat> and uh, the, dog, the dog stopped. And so the impulse is to run from the dog. And in this story, the Dalai Lama actually turned, rather than running, turned towards the dog and moved towards it. And I feel like that's analogous to what we're talking about here, is that if I have pain inside, what would it be to stop running from it, whether with my various addictions? By the way, one of the best resources on talking about how we're addicted to thinking, how we're addicted to the default mode network, if you've read any of the literature by Eckhart Tolle, The Power of Now, A New Earth, any of his books, every one of them addresses how it is that if we have an addiction, it might be addiction to this default mode network. It's a way that I can stay busy. It's a way I can stay occupied. It's a way that I can make sure that I'm familiar to myself and so on. And to stop that means that it allows the possibility of stuff to rise up into consciousness. But it's only when it rises up into consciousness that we can exert executive control over it. And by executive control, I don't mean controlling it like you would putting a thumb on something, but we can bring it into conversation with people that can help us with it. We can uh, find ways of working creatively with it to find our right relationship to it. So. The question again, I want to make sure I addressed it. Can you say anything about mindfulness actually bringing up more pain as we face ourselves? It can. It can for sure. I don't think that there's any magic bullets in this whole business of addiction and recovery. I don't think there's some magic formula. But I think there are skillful means by which we can begin to get at the roots of our addiction. And this is one of them, I feel like is that uh, it opens the door. I suspect there's other angles I could take on answering this question, but I want to stick with that one for right now. And if, if uh, there's more that comes up, I'm happy to address it if we have time today or after, after our session today. There was a second question. You said that you need to have something to fight addiction, something equal to it. So my question is, what's equal to it? I want to go two directions with this. First of all, I want to be really clear about something, is that in the natural order of things, there's nothing that can compete with cocaine or heroin or methamphetamine in terms of just looking at them biologically. Their release of intense dopamine in the brain, there's nothing in the natural order that can compete with them. If sexual orgasm doubles our baseline dopamine, cocaine quadruples it. So if you use your, your normal state of uh, awareness and arousal, a uh, one, 
and, and sexual orgasm doubles that, cocaine quadruples it, heroin is 10 times the amount of dopamine, methamphetamine is 12 times the amount. I wanna make sure that I'm clear that nothing can compete with that in the natural order of things. But I don't think that's what your question is about. I mean, that's, that's one thing I wanna say. I don't wanna to pretend to those that have dealt with addiction that when they stop taking heroin or, or methamphetamine, that life is gonna be easy. The fact is it's gonna take them months or sometimes years for their brain and body to reset to where natural reinforcers like love and purpose and meaning and caring and compassion and creativity begin to have some kind of uh, gravitas, some kind of leverage or traction. So it takes, it takes a while for that to develop back. And the list I just gave you is, is suggestive of what is necessary to fight, uh, fight addiction. I think you have to come up with alternatives that run deeply. And so I just named a bunch of them right there. And uh, love and creativity and purpose and meaning and um, integrity. I just sat today, I'm thinking of a man who today said, I asked him because he has about eight months in recovery and he was in a group today where most of the men have two weeks of recovery. And I said, can you comment on what you've what you found? And I think his answer pertains to this question. He said, what I know now in terms of what it feels like to be inside my skin and to be living with a sense of, he used the word integrity, I can't imagine ever being addicted. I can't imagine my, he said, I, couldn't Im I can't even remember what it's like to be addicted because this, this way of being, it's a greater fire. And it's like following his North Star has supplanted his, his, his craving for addiction. So an honest conversation into that, and I think if that's also uh, an entry point into this, can I, we, we've talked about this in recent podcasts here. Can I get myself back to what is my purpose, my, uh, my fate, my destiny? We talked about it. What is my original face before I was born? And I think it takes something that profound uh, to fight addiction. And even with that, there's no guarantees. There was a third question. Oh, thank you. This person said, what was most helpful was doing the meditation with me, with us, and with others. There's something very powerful about sharing this with others, and thank you for saying that. Um, you know, Austin is putting together meditations that we've done over the last uh, few weeks and months, and I think over time we'll have access to resources that are meditation specific that you can access these and practice these. I wanna move into the final part of today's presentation and it's about practice, is that if you had a good experience today, like this individual said, and I'm grateful for you to say that, uh, I'm grateful for having done the meditation with you all. Um, if you had, a, if you had a, a, a positive experience, that's wonderful. The fact is, is that can you imagine what it would be like to cultivate or to build these muscles, so to speak, of meditation to where you get better and better at accessing a peaceful place? Uh, today's experiment with swimming was <laughs> not done that. In my recollection, I've not done that. And I found, oh, now I can meditate while I swim. I love to swim and I love to meditate, and it's like they can become the same. I just drummed last night, and I move into a zone uh, or flow with drumming where drumming becomes a meditation. So imagine what it would be like to practice this, where you can access what we're calling the shift from default mode network to executive mode network at will. I don't know that I can do it at will, but I can certainly do it more often now. And uh, I want to encourage you to consider a couple of resources. The image that we're talking about today is how do we wake up from that other way of being? And the title of our presentation, Waking Up with Mindfulness, I mean specifically waking up from the trance that we live in most of the time, which is the default mode network. This busy like a bee, scurrying around, coming up with things to be concerned about. I'm remembering right now, years ago, I studied the Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard, and he had this phrase where he said, it's oftentimes easier to be worried about something rather than being focused on no thing, on nothing. And what he meant by that is that we have a thousand somethings that we can focus on. That's what the default mode network does. And when we move into a meditative or a mindful, a mindful, a, a, a mindful state of awareness, we're really moving into a place of there's no thing. 
Notice how we said it, when a thought comes up, just notice it, label it, but don't follow it. And pretty soon you get to where you get these little blocks of space and time, and hopefully you experience some of that. Somebody was sharing it with me earlier in a group this week. He, he imagines a, a chalkboard that's been erased. And when a thought comes in, he allows the thought, he names it, and then he erases the chalkboard. And then soon enough, the chalkboard is blank for longer and longer periods of time. I love that image. So we're talking about waking up to that, waking up to spaciousness, waking up to peace, waking up to a state of calm. One of the best resources I know to talk into this, I'm going to mention this and we'll have uh, Austin bring this up, this book, Integral Life Practice. Um, it, the focus of this is the practice part is the idea of integral is body, mind, spirit. So it's a holistic approach to, to our lives. And the book is full of exercises for how do we practice this to where we become fully alive to ourselves physically, mentally, emotionally, creatively, spiritually, and so on. And so I, I want to recommend this book. The author, the chief author, is an incredibly significant influence in my own development psychologically is Ken Wilber. Here's Ken Wilber. I recently did another podcast separately with Ken uh, with the next friend I'm going to introduce, and that podcast will be coming out sooner or later, and when it does, I'll announce it here. Ken Wilbur, in his book, uh, Integral Life Practice, talks about this four-part hmm, template for practice, and it's waking up, which is what we're talking about today, Growing up, which is what we talked about two weeks ago, we had two sessions on growing up. We were talking about beginning to develop across the various levels of our lives, developing our physical health, developing our mental and emotional health. So that would be growing up. We're going to be talking about cleaning up in the coming weeks, and we'll be talking specifically around cleaning up from shadow material. And then finally, showing up. And we've talked about showing up here in terms of showing up. We talked about this in terms of a quadrant model. How do I show up uh, 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 for myself? How do I show up uh, for my relationships? How do I show up as being responsible out in the world? How do I show up caring for my physical body down to the cellular level? And so what Ken Wilber is talking about in integral life practice is waking up the way that we've talked about today, growing up, cleaning up, and showing up. And the best model that I know for applying this to addiction recovery is this next individual. And I'd ask you to bring this picture up. This is my dear, dear friend, John Dupuy. This is John. You get some sense of John from this photograph. <laughs> it's a dear, dear friend of mine. And John's book, the next, the next slide, is simply called Integral Recovery. And it's an application of, of what we just discussed. Waking up, growing up, cleaning up, showing up, applied to addiction recovery. If you have interest in, in a holistic or body, mind, spirit approach to addiction recovery, this is the best book I know of. And so I highly recommend John's book. So what's to be done next? Daily practice of what we did today. And so I recommend that you go back and review this video and practice begin what you'll experience if you do this for seven days if you do this for a week you'll begin to experience more and more skill at being able to clear that chalkboard be able to clear the mind and uh, have a palpable shift from default mode network to executive mode network and imagine doing that if you can experience that much of a shift in a week imagine doing that for a month imagine doing that for six months it'll change your life so there's hope here, you all, and the hope is, is that we are able and might at last be able to learn how to quiet the default mode network that keeps us in that stressful pattern that Judson Brewer talked about that leads so many of us to addictive behaviors. So I commend you to practice. I commend you to staying in touch with me uh, uh, to discuss how that's going for you. Uh, uh, my, my website I'll introduce in just a second, which is bobweathers.com. You can write to me, tell me how you're progressing with this. I want you to come back next week, you all, because we'll follow up on this conversation about waking up. We'll also uh, introduce and deepen into uh, what I call the dimension of soul, which I, which I tie directly to creativity. And this gets back to the first question that was asked, what kinds of things can, can, can we do to... Uh, uh, 
what could possibly compete with, uh, with, with addiction uh, in terms of a kind of equal and opposite force. And I don't know how to separate that out from personal creativity. And so come back next week for that conversation. I want to ask before we finish up, uh, Austin, did I address all three questions? I did? Okay. I want to check and see. Um, thank you all for, for uh, sending those questions our way. Um, my mind uh, works things, <laughs> and yours might too. So if you sent those questions, and there are parts of what I said that were satisfying to you and parts that remain unanswered, I really invite you to write me, and you can write me at this, at this, uh, uh, at this uh, website. Uh, there's a uh, question and comments. You can just send me your question and comments because I'm very interested in staying in, in, in conversation with you. And uh, I invite you back as well for next week as we look at creativity. Thank you for joining me today. I really hope and pray that you would have a mindful week. And I want to thank all of you again uh, for joining me and supporting Austin and me and uh, Ask an Addiction Special. It's wonderful to have you with us each week. Many blessings to you. Uh, wish you well.